Hello and welcome to the video research workshop using Amazon MTurk for video research. I'm Andrea Langrish, Managing Director for the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement. This workshop is hosted by the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement and the Advanced Methods at Purdue in Behavioral Health and Social Sciences. To tell us more about this workshop is Dr. Robert Browning, Professor and Faculty Director for the Center of C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement and the Executive Director of the C-SPAN Archives. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're, we put these workshops together because we found that during our research conferences, there were a lot of different ways that people were using C-SPAN in their research. And we wanted to explore some of those in more depth to give people a chance to ask questions of the users. And uh, actually, uh, Zach was one of those people who presented and he used Mechanical Turk or MTurk. And I said, you know, people would want to know how you, what your pluses and minuses were of what you learned and what didn't work and what didn't work because that's a, it's becoming more and more popular in social science research. So that's sort of how the ideas come about. So if you've got an idea that you want to hear about or that you want, if you've thought about in your own research, let me know and uh, we'll, we could schedule a workshop. We're scheduling for next semester. We wanna have some re research to next semester on video processing, because that's something that a lot of people are doing text processing, but we wanna explore the new ways that video can be processed. So look forward to more announcements for that from Andrea and we'll turn it back to Andrea now. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. So our featured scholar is Zachary Isaacs. He's currently a PhD student studying political communication in the Brian Lamb School of Communication at Purdue University. His research, which focuses on news framing of deviant behavior, such as domestic terror terrorism and protests, and also on political socialization, has been published in the Year in C-SPAN Archives, Archives Research and Public Relations Inquiry. He currently has two articles under review at Journalism and Mass Communication Quarterly and The American Behavioral Scientist. Zachary has also presented his work at multiple national and regional conferences. Welcome, Zachary Isaacs. All right, thank you for the very warm introduction, Andrea and Robert. I will share my screen here so we can begin. Um, I'm gonna be starting today. And today, as we kind of previewed, I'll be talking about using Amazon's MTurk for video research, specifically using the C-SPAN video library. So um, first of all, here's some of my contact information where you can find me. Um, I'm very reachable via email and also via Twitter. You can uh, follow me on Twitter for just uh, random bits of, of information, academia life I might post about. So a short preview of the workshop, what we're gonna talk about today. First of all, I'm going to talk about experiments using the C-SPAN video library. So I'm going to go over a few things here. First of all, how people have used the C-SPAN video library in research before. Um, just a little bit of a preview, it, isn't, it hasn't been used much for experimental research. So I'll talk about what are the benefits of using the C-SPAN video library in experimental research, because there are definitely a few. Then I'll go into um, the actual C-SPAN website, and I'll kind of show you guys around. How are we actually going to uh, find some of these videos or some of these transcripts that we can use as experimental stimuli. So I'll go through there and, and kind of talk you through my own process of how I find ex experimental stimuli. Then I'll pause for a quick Q&A on experiments using the library. So this will be a time um, for all of you to just ask whatever questions you have over this first portion of the workshop. Then the second portion of the workshop following that Q&A, I'll do a quick overview of MTurk, basically what it is, the foundations of it, how it started and that kind of thing. Then I'll give you a step-by-step -step how to basically for how to set up a study in MTurk. So even if you're somebody who's never done a study in MTurk before, this should be a very um, helpful workshop to get you from point A to point B. Then I'll discuss the methodological advantages and limitations of MTurk. There are certainly a lot of advantages, but there are also certainly a lot of limitations um, to using MTurk. So those will be discussed and then finally, we'll have um, a Q&A over the MTurk section. And then also, of course, if you have questions that you kind of forgot about from the, uh, from the earlier section, you can feel free to ask those then as well. And one thing I just want 
bring up right right off the bat is that I want this to be as um, engaging as and as interactive as possible. So if you have questions throughout, please feel free to you can send them in the chat or you can um, like raise your hand on your Zoom. You can do um, whatever you, you would like to do, but I, I want to make sure this is useful for you as possible. So please let me know if there's questions along the way, even before or outside of the Q and A's that I've set up. So let's just first start off with kind of talking about how the C-SPAN video library has been used in the past um, for research. So most studies using the library perform big data analysis or content analysis. And so if you go to any of the uh, C-SPAN research uh, conferences that we've had in the past, the vast majority of them are gonna be talking about big data analysis or content analysis. And rightfully so, honestly, right? Considering there's over 270,000 hours of content on the C-SPAN website, there's huge, huge amounts of content that you can use for big data analysis or content analysis, right? However, far fewer have used experimental designs using the library. So what I kind of mean by this is that very few have used any of the videos or the transcripts that you can find on the C-SPAN website, very few of them have actually used those as experimental stimuli. So next, I just kind of want to say, why should you use, uh, or why should experimental research be done using the library, right? So first of all, there's nearly limitless amounts of experimental stimuli. As I said, there's about 270,000 um, hours worth of content on the website. So you can you can find experimental stimuli from as far back as the 1970s to as recently as last week. So there's a lot of opportunities to find a lot of different videos. Another really big plus of using this as experimental stimuli is that it's real unedited content, right? So you can get um, videos straight from the source, which is really, really nice. Another thing is that the videos span across many different disciplines. So um, I know many of you in here probably aren't even political communication scholars, and that is perfectly okay and acceptable, right? Because um, here at C-SPAN, this is really interdisciplinary um, type things that you can find on the website. So I'll, I'll go through those here in a second and kind of talk about um, all the different ways that we can use it across different disciplines. And then one thing that I've been kind of alluding to is that you don't just have to use uh, this, the C-SPAN video library for the actual videos, right? You can also use them for the transcripts. So again, I will kind of uh, demonstrate this once I actually jump into it. So without further ado, and you can actually kind of uh, do this along with me, I, I will ask you to navigate to uh, cspan.org. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to stop this screen share and start a new one. So. Now we're on the C-SPAN website. So just right off the bat, we can kind of see some, some newer things from today. So that, that's just a nice thing about the C-SPAN website. Now up here is the uh, search function where I would recommend you just start with, right? Um, so one thing I can think about is, well, what's, what's one thing that we could do an experiment on? Well, one thing that's um, really kind of in the, in the cultural zeitgeist right now is COVID-19, right? So we can just type in, oops can't type today. So we can just type in COVID and we can see what comes up, right? So here we get a bunch of different videos um, all about COVID-19, right? So it's obviously going to be just from the past couple of years that these have been in. But for example, you might want to see, let's say that you're doing an experiment on COVID and you want to see how people react to different messages that they get from different people. So maybe you want to react to, or you want to see how people react to um, COVID-19 information given by Dr. Fauci versus President Trump. So you could find uh, different videos of each of them speaking. So one thing that you could do is that you could look for either videos or clips here. Uh, let's just click videos for now. And then once you click videos, these are like full length videos that you can see. And see, we already see Dr. Fauci right here. Um, one thing that you can do is you can add people to search for. So like I said, if we wanted to see how Dr. Fauci versus um, President Trump spoke about um, or people's reactions to them, we could actually look for uh, these specific people here in the drop down menu. So you can see uh, Anthony Fauci MD here. So we can click the box, and all of these videos that we'll get will be with Dr. Fauci in them somewhere, um, or him being mentioned, or yeah, him being featured in them. So you can see here there's 179 videos of Dr. Fauci speaking about COVID 19. So you can see there is a lot of options uh, to choose from if you wanted to actually do an experiment on this. 
And then same thing, we can unselect Dr. Fauci. And let's say that we wanted to also see President Trump speaking about COVID-19. We can see here that there's even more options. There's 220 videos um, of him speaking about COVID-19. So there's obviously a lot of different options here for experimental stimuli. So I really think that that's an interesting thing. So for some of you who might be in health communication or maybe even like public health or not even in a communication related field, there's certainly some things in here like you know um, videos about COVID that you could use for experimental research. Now, another thing that you could do something on, um, you know, I'm just trying to think of something, it could be something like climate change, right? So it could be climate change. And let's say that you wanna see how people uh, throughout the years, how their perceptions change based on um, the year that the, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking of something, the year that these, um, that these speeches were made, right? So you wanna see how people react to those differently. So here you can look for the dates of, of these. So let's see just from 2001. Let's see, November, 2001. Oops, I had to click enter. So November 8th, there's nothing on November 8th, 2001 about climate change, but let's say that we go for a full year until 2002. So throughout this full year, you can see however many um, times climate change was talked about, okay? Um, so I think that that could be really interesting. And then you could compare that possibly to, um, well, how climate change has been talked about in 20 or in 2021. So you could see that. Let's see how many climate, how many times climate change, uh, whoops, that's the, that's the wrong way there. So even just, okay, so we can see that, oops, sorry. I need to get my dates figured out here. Okay, there we go. So we just see that in the past two weeks, climate change has been at least mentioned how many times here? I can't see it. 17 times, at least in 17 different videos, right? In the past two weeks. So again, there's so many different ways that you can kind of uh, pick through the, uh, the video library here with a lot of different tags as well. Again, different dates, different people. And these are just videos that I'm searching for. You can also search for clips. So you can see user generated clips. Um, so even just in the past two weeks, there's been 38 clips created. Um, this is by users and also by um, other people who work for C-SPAN who've created these clips. And you can also create your own clips, which I think is a really um, useful tool. So I can just kind of show you how this might happen. So let's just take this first one, for instance. If you don't want your, um, let's say you're doing an experiment, again, on climate change, and you don't want people to watch a you know 30 minute long video as your experimental stimuli, that's probably a bit too long. Let's say you just wanna do a two minute clip of it. You could start this video. I'm not gonna start it right now, but you could start this video and you could click uh, this clip button right here and you can create your own clip. So that's a really useful tool uh, for us social science researchers to be able to create our own clips so that we can create experimental stimuli however long or short we want. So I think that that's a really um, useful thing that we can do. Oh, sorry, Andrea, I just saw that you, it was uh, your chat. I was just looking at the chat. All right. Um, and then another thing is that you can book this, bookmark any video you want or any clip you want to your uh, My C-SPAN account. So one thing that you can do, I'm already logged in, but up here, you can see where you can create an account. I would highly recommend for anybody who wants to use the C-SPAN video library to create your own account so that you can really easily um, track all of your clips. So that's gonna be really useful. Okay, um, I'm going to quickly stop my, stop my share and go back to uh, my PowerPoint quickly. This will be one of the last times I have to do this. I apologize. Okay, so with that in mind, now that I've just kind of shown you a little bit how to navigate the C-SPAN website, I wanna give you a little bit of a, um, I'm not gonna go in depth about my own research here, but I just wanted to give you an example of really kind of what I did um, to go through and, and think about, um, you know, how to actually find these experimental stimuli or how to find these videos on the C-SPAN website. So until this was a research study I did for the C-SPAN conference last fall. So about a year ago, exactly. Um, me and a colleague, we studied gender schema and we wanted to see how people's perceptions of female speakers, specifically politicians, could vary based on the topic of their speech. 
So we really wanted to find a, a speech that was nonpartisan, um, that like, you know, it could be a Democrat or a Republican saying it. We also wanted to find um, where like, again, where basically where gender wasn't a super relevant issue. So we kind of wanted to alter it ourselves basically. So because we wanted to alter things ourselves and we weren't confident in like our, our video editing abilities, we use transcripts to vary the speaker's gender. So um, I can kind of explain that a little bit here in a second when I show you the transcripts. And we used a three by two experimental design. So basically we used a, a speech on terrorism and a speech on education. And we altered the uh, gender of the speaker between those. So we had a female speaker uh, speaking about education. We had a male speaker speaking about education. And then we had a speaker that was not identified as any gender speaking about education. And then we did the same thing for terrorism. So we had about six experimental uh, conditions that we used for this. So with this in mind, I wanna show you like the, the actual um, process that I, went to, that I went through as I was thinking about how to do this. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And now here is the first clip um, that we used. So you can see that we found the, the specific clip we wanted in a two hour long video. So we only used a clip that was about um, two minutes long or three minutes long about, and we used a, um, the transcript of it. Now I haven't really shown you how to find transcripts yet, but this is a really nice um, thing that they do here on, um, on the C-SPAN website is you can look through here Whenever a person changes um, speaking, basically whenever a different person starts speaking, they'll break up the transcript here so you can see exactly when they started and stopped speaking. So that's really nice. So um, the actual transcript that we use here was this one, was this, this long text. Now, one thing that I want to kind of um, caution you with, with using these is that they're not gonna be perfect because they're basically closed captions. They're very, very close to what the um, speaker is actually saying. So one thing I would recommend is to um, is to actually listen to the full clip yourself before you download any of these transcripts, right? So make sure that all of these actually line up 100%. So with that in mind, I just kind of want to show you a short, um, just a sh short snippet of this so you can see kind of what it looks like. Oh, never mind. So it looks like I would have to restart my computer if I want to use audio. So I'm gonna I'm going to skip. Um, actually playing this then. But basically he was just giving a, um, a short breakdown of the United States' involvement in terrorism abroad. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily partisan in nature and it wasn't obvious necessarily um, like that it was trying to activate any particular gender schema. Um, so that was kind of why we chose this specific topic. Now, one thing I just kind of want to say is kind of what I went through is that we searched for terrorism here. That's literally the way that we started our, our search pro process for actually looking for, um, for this video. We just searched terrorism and we were like, let's see what we can find. And we were going through and we were finding a lot of, um, frankly, a lot of very partisan um, videos, right? And we were like, well, we wanna find something a little bit less partisan. So we started kind of searching through and then we um, decided to look for videos specifically talking about 9-11. So we added that as a, as a search term as well. So there's a lot of different things that you can do here to try to find the stimuli that you really want to find. So that's really what I'm trying to get at. Now, the other clip that we used was an education uh, clip. And this was actually Betsy DeVos. Now, I know, know that you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking, well, I can't think of a person more partisan than Betsy DeVos. Um, so Actually, what she's saying in this clip isn't really partisan. She's talking about facts about where the United States ranks in, in relation to education with other countries in the world. So I thought that that was really interesting. It was a very, very fact-based speech. So that's why we picked it. And again here, uh, we can see all the, different, um, um, all the different transcripts that we have here. And this is the one that we use. This is when uh, Betsy DeVos was talking about this. So again, a nonpartisan thing. And that was kind of why we chose this one. And the same thing uh, we did here, we just started with searching education. So we started with just searching about education. And again, wanted to look for something that was kind of nonpartisan. 
Um, and we also wanted to look for something that wasn't super specific again. Now, that's, that's something I haven't really talked about yet as, um, as something to kind of think about in relation to how to think about what kind of transcripts or videos you should use in your experimental research. But we didn't want to find something that was going to be too specific that would go over most people's heads, right? So we wanted to find um, we wanted to find clips that were a little bit more general in nature that weren't super specific in talking about, well, here's our actual policy on Afghanistan in 2003, right? We wanted to find something a little bit more general that most people would, would understand and would find approachable. So that's something that you might kind of um, have to think about and might have to grapple with a little bit as you're um, creating your experiments using the C-SPAN library. So that's really kind of what I wanted to show here um, for how to use the, um, the archives here. So let me bring up my PowerPoint again. Okay, so with this in mind, I already brought these up. May I please take your questions um, on this section? So I know that I went through a lot in a little amount of time, um, but I was hoping that you all would have some questions about possibly you know, how to navigate the, um, the C-SPAN website or anything like that. If there's anything that um, I can answer, that'd be great. And to make it a little more engaging for Zach, if you guys could please uh, turn your cameras on. <laughs> that makes if it you want to, If you wanna ask a question, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or you can type in chat too, that's perfectly okay. Yep. So Zach, I did have a question about um, when you're using your Qualtrics, so are you providing your um, video clip links ahead of time to the, to the um, my profile, to, to the people that are participating, the participants? Um, mm -hmm. Are you providing that to them and then giving them the Qualtrics or are you getting them watch, getting them to watch it first, then giving the Qualtrics? I'm trying to yeah, figure that's out that a good question. action. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so because in this specific uh, research study that I'm talking, I was using transcripts. So I had them read the transcript first um, and then had them answer the questions. We were basically trying to see if those transcripts would activate people's gender schema. And I know that I didn't necessarily like, you know, do a great job of explaining the research considering I only did it in a couple of minutes. Um, but gender schema is really all about um, people's prior beliefs about gender and how people view people's um, like gender roles in society, essentially. So that's what it's all about. Um, and we, just to talk a little bit about, um, just a little bit more context, I suppose, um, we actually didn't find that the transcripts um, elucidated those um, gender schemas. So we think that it could possibly be because it wasn't enough of a experimental condition. So we were actually considering um, if you wanted to replicate it, you could use the videos themselves. Um, the reason we didn't use the videos themselves is again, because we didn't want to um, you know, activate any partisan ties and things like that. But I'm sure that th there are ways to control for that. So that's something in the future that I might consider doing. But um, Andrea, kind of back to your original question. Um, sorry about that little, that little tangent. Um, back to your original question. You can embed the videos in your Qualtrics surveys. So that's what I would recommend is embedding those videos. Now, one thing I didn't necessarily talk about, and Andrea, you can probably answer this question a little bit better, is that currently there's not any great way right now to download um, clips or videos from the C-SPAN website. Um, so probably the best way to go about actually putting in the videos into Qualtrics would be to embed the videos um, directly from the C-SPAN website. Because right now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrea, but whenever you're downloading, or Robert for that matter, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're downloading these, um, these videos, it, it costs like 99 cents to download one or is there a way to do it for free? There's a way to do it for free. And you just, um, and particularly on the Purdue campus, I don't think we charge. So if you have a purdue.edu address, use that. And just go walk through the, the problem is we don't know who you are till you attempt to download it. So once you put in your Purdue EDU email, then it figures it out and it knows that to let you go through. Gotcha. Can people who don't have a Purdue.edu email, can they also download them for free or no? Uh, yes. If you have a, a MySpan account, you're allowed 
more limited amount for free. Got it. Okay. But yeah, you want to have the My C-SPAN account with your ID, use a Purdue ID if you have it, and uh, go from there. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. But and how, if I can ask a question, can't, don't you think that Betsy DeVos evokes partisanship? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would say that she evokes partisanship for sure. Um, which is why we use the transcript. So no one knew that it was actually Betsy DeVos speaking. Um, I see. Yeah. So no, no one knew who the actual speaker was. We simply, we actually made up names. We called them, um, I can't remember the actual name that we use, but it's something like Secretary Smith or something like that. And then we referred to them by like their gendered pronouns. So either Miss or Mr. or whatever. So that's kind of how we, we altered the, the actual gender. So yeah, that's a good question, Robert. Um, I see that we have a we have a raised hand here. Uh, Yungun, is that how you pronounce it? I'm sorry if I'm butchering your pronunciation. Hi, um, my name is Yunga. First of all, thank you for this um, presentation. It's really useful. Um, this is something that um, you know I didn't know about this research, so it's good to know. Um, and sorry, I can't. I'm not camera ready in the background. So. That's okay. That's okay. Um, but I was wondering. It, this is not about research, but I was wondering if you have experience of using this like for your classroom teaching. It seems ah, yeah. like yours, but I know like, for example, YouTube videos, like students in China cannot have access to it. Um, or are there like any, like, I don't know, like copyright issue of using it for classroom or things like that? Yeah, so we actually, um, and this is something that CCSE as a whole has really been pushing, especially at Purdue is is for people to integrate these videos into campus uh, into like classroom teaching. So that is something that I've been working on a little bit more and frankly could do a better job of using uh, the C-SPAN video library in my own teaching. So that is certainly something that I think more people should be using, for sure. And oh, like I yeah. said, there's, yes. yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of videos to use, yeah. so. That's awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, of course. Plus, you with the uh, with the students, you can count on them not knowing who Betty DeVos is, <laughs> Betsy DeVos yeah. is, or other yeah. people, candidates. If you want to do candidate debates, they you know they don't know uh, who these people are, so that they don't have, have they don't have prior evaluations. Yep, exactly. All right, I see we have another uh, raised hand here. Oh, were you referring to me? Oh, uh, yeah, Yasun Dhara, is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, Basu. You can call me Basu. Okay. Uh, so um, I, I think this is more about the technicality of the experiment that you ran. So um, I know that you said that you tried to um, identify uh, videos and stuff which were not partisan. So did you pretest it? Did you uh, get someone to like, was it some, did you use your own discretion to identify these videos and then sort of use them? Or did you sort of like get someone else to also vet it or like run a pretest, which where pe most of the people who saw the video, who read the transcript understood it as not partisan or partisan? Uh, that's, videos. so that's, that's a very good question. Um, I think my, my video is frozen, is it not? Um, okay, regardless. Yeah, your, your video not... is frozen. I thought for a moment <laughs> okay. there was something wrong with mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, my video is frozen. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and actually a limitation that I mentioned in the conference is that we actually did not um, pretest either, either of our transcripts for whether or not they actually did um, elucidate you know, partisan thoughts. So it was, it was more based on me and my colleagues um, you know, just thoughts or, or basically our appraisal on whether or not it was partisan. So no, we didn't do a pretest, which was one of our limitations and, and we probably should have, but there was a little bit of a, a time constraint that we we just didn't necessarily have a ton of time to pretest. So that's a really good question though. Thanks so much for sharing that because I'm in the middle of doing an experiment myself and like I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah I'm just like picking your brains here. <laughs> yeah for sure and and that is something that I would definitely recommend uh, mm -hmm. most people to do if they're doing experimental research especially doing political research is that um, doing pretests is really important 
um, because you want to make sure that these videos aren't going to be activating things that you don't want them to be, right? And frankly, because we're using transcripts, we're a little bit less concerned about activating those um, those partisan thoughts. So, yep. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. Are there any other questions um, in relation to the first uh, kind of half of this of this workshop? Okay, if there is anything else that kind of comes up along the way, please feel free to let me know. And I would, you know, I'll stop whenever. So please feel free to ask a question in chat or you can raise your hand. Either one of those is perfectly fine. Okay, so now that we've talked about how to actually, you know, find some of those experimental stimuli and some of those videos and transcripts on the C-SPAN website, now I'm gonna kind of transition into talking a little bit more about mTurk. So the first thing I wanna talk about is why it has its name and some uh, common misnomers, things like that. So first of all, the name is based on the Turk and this is a picture of the Turk. Um, the Turk was a machine in I believe the 18th century that was supposedly playing people in chess. It was a machine that was playing people in chess and it was beating a lot of people in chess. So it was, it was beating famous people like Napoleon Bonaparte, Ben Franklin, and these people were the, under the impression that they were actually playing a machine. When in reality, as you can see here in like the bottom right of the image, it was actually a human uh, chess master that was playing people in chess. So in fact, it wasn't the machine at all that was doing it. It was, it was a person. And the reason that MTurk is named MTurk is because the whole purpose of MTurk is to have humans do tasks that, well, computers can't necessarily do as easily, right? Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the backstory behind MTurk. Now, some of the basics on MTurk, it was launched in 2005. So this, this idea actually came directly from Jeff Bezos himself. He came up with the idea of having a website where people could come and get some tasks done that were really hard for computers to do, but very, very easy and simple for humans. Um, so believe it or not, there actually are still those tasks out there that computers can't do better than we can. Shocker, right? So there's over 500,000 workers worldwide. However, I believe over 80% of those workers are based in the United States. Um, so about 400,000 of those uh, workers worldwide are based in the United States. And then a large portion of those outside of the US are based in India. And then there's representation though from about 190 countries throughout the world of people that work for MTurk. And like I said, these are useful for tasks that are hard for computers to do, but really easy for humans, right? So I'll go over some examples of things that you can do on MTurk, but things like um, people transcribing uh, interviews or, or data, things like that, finding um, information in pictures, and then also surveys, which I will be talking about the most. Now, requesters can submit tasks via the MTurk requester site, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today, or through an application programming interface. So um, that's something that isn't really in my area of expertise that I won't be talking about today, but that is something that you can do. So if you're interested in using um, Python or another, um, or another thing like that, you can actually you know, start your tasks and your surveys that way, but it's far easier to just use the MTurk requester site and it's, it's a lot easier to do it that way. So that's what I'm gonna be focusing on. And all you need to start an MTurk requester account is an Amazon account. So it's, it's really easy to start that. So that's one of the pluses that I'm gonna say about MTurk right off the bat is that it's super easy to get an account because everybody, well, pretty much everybody has an Amazon account. So it's really easy to start. Now there's some key terms that we need to know here because um, MTurk likes using a lot of jargon like MTurk itself that in, it, in and of itself is jargon. So number one, you need to know what a requester is. That's the person or organization creating a task. So that would just be you submitting a survey or, or me submitting a survey, I would be the requester. Uh, the second thing to kind of keep in mind is a worker. And these people are often referred to as Turkers. So people who work for uh, MTurk are often called Turkers. So those will be kind of used interchangeably and I'll use those interchangeably uh, throughout this presentation. And then the worker is the person that completes the task. And then the last one that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind is a hit, uh, which is a human intelligence task, uh, which is just the task that the workers complete. So if you submit a survey 
um, that will be called a hit. And some of this lingo is really important to know because um, after you start a task or after you start a survey project on MTER, it's likely that um, you know if you're getting you know a couple hundred responses, it's likely that you might get an email or something like that from one of the workers and they'll be asking you a question about something. And a lot of times they'll assume that you're very uh, up to date on the Amazon jargon. So it's really important to kind of understand the jargon because otherwise they're, you're gonna be pretty lost. <laughs> so these are some of the really important things that we kind of need to know just right off the bat before we even start talking about MTurk anymore. So some of the types of tasks that can be requested on MTurk, um, number one, collecting information from pictures. So businesses will sometimes have people do this. Um, social scientists can also do this. Um, so collecting information from pictures. Also transcription, it's a really easy way um, and, and pretty cheap way to have things transcribed. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, you can also just have workers collect information from the internet. So if you want people to frankly do some like rudimentary research for you, uh, MTurk can also do that as well. Then website testing, um, sometimes businesses and even academics possibly um, will want their website tested. And this gives you a really easy way to get a ton of people to test your website. And then last, what I will be focusing on uh, throughout the rest of this workshop will be on surveys because that is uh, the majority of what is done on MTurk these days is survey type research, especially for social sciences. I believe 90% um, of the academics that are on MTurk are using it for the survey collection function. So surveys is by far the most applicable thing that you can use on MTurk. Now, I'm going to give kind of a step-by-step -step overview now of how to create a project in MTurk. Um, I'm not gonna go to the MTurk uh, website right now. I have a bunch of pictures. I'm basically going to kind of walk you through it that way. But if you'd like to, again, do it just like um, what we did with the C-SPAN tutorial, if you would like to do that with MTurk as well, you can follow all these same directions I'm about to talk about. Um, so all you have to do is go to requester.mturk.com and um, you can create your own account using your Amazon account and you can follow these exact steps that I'm about to go through. So without further ado, let's talk about this. So first of all, once you actually go through to that link, um, oh, sorry, there we go. So once you go through to that link, um, this is what the requester website will look like when you initially get into it. So you can see just up at the top, you have a couple of different um, tabs you can click on. So first is the create button. Um, this is where you can create new projects um, or you can start new batches with an existing pro uh, project. I'll talk about a batch here in a second. That's another lingo term that we're gonna need to know. So first of all, we see this screen uh, where we have a basically a template for how you can start new projects, which is really nice about MTurk. They give you these, um, these templates where you can start your projects from. So it's really nice. Now, what I'm gonna be focusing on throughout this project or throughout this workshop is a survey link and how to create a survey link in MTurk, basically. Um, you can create your own survey in MTurk, but I wouldn't recommend that because their survey function is not as um, broad or as, or as deep as say a Qualtrics would be. So I'm gonna be basically just talking about Qualtrics here, especially since that's what Purdue uses as its main um, survey function. So with that in mind, we can use this survey link function to create a project using a Qualtrics survey that we built in Qualtrics, right? So basically what will happen once we actually create this project is that the people, um, the, the Turkers, if you will, um, they will follow the link that you give them and they will complete uh, your survey in Qualtrics, but then you will uh, pay them and everything through MTurk. So basically you're gonna have to use uh, both Qualtrics and MTurk. So, just a few of the different options that you can see on the left, left hand side of the screen here for what you can do. Um, again, we have like the different survey options. So survey link or survey you can also do a bunch of different things where you can have people analyze the sentiment of a, of a specific message. Um, you could have people detect emotion. Um, you could do uh, translation quality. You can have, um, again, people identify images and things like that. So there are a lot of different functions on MTurk that I'm not going to talk about today because frankly, there's too many to cover. So I'm just gonna be focusing on the survey links. So with that in mind, um, 
this is just kind of like our original, um, what we see here when we click on the survey link option on the left. And you can put in your own survey link and then you'll see here, this is what the actual Turkers will see um, when they have to take the survey. So it's super easy for them to see. So if you wanna start um, creating your project, you just click the create project button down at the bottom right. So um, here, when you click that create project button, you'll get to uh, this page here where your base three tabs at the top. And on the first tab, this is really the most important part um, of the whole thing, I would say, is um, setting up your, uh, your project correctly. So first of all, you need to type in, you know, your project name, the title, um, and then you want to give a short description about your project so that the Turkers or the, the uh, participants know what your project is actually about. So you want to type in the description and then keywords. Um, so basically these Turkers, they can search through hundreds of surveys to find ones that they might be interested in. So it's always good to include keywords that can um, you know, help them find your survey. So some keywords that might be good are just like, you know, for mine, I believe I used politics, survey, you know, things like that, right? Just kind of general ones that would lead them to mine. So this is the first thing that you'll see in the enter properties uh, window. Now, if you scroll down on the um, enter properties window, you'll get to this portion, which is probably the most important portion. So first of all, you're going to select your reward per response. So you're gonna tell people how much they're gonna be paid per response. I'll talk about payment uh, for workers here in a little bit, um, but in general, the vast majority are paid under a dollar for each of these. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. So I'll talk about that again um, later, but basically you can charge as little as one cent for something or as much as $60. Um, so it has to be kind of within that range. However, I would really, um, I would encourage definitely not to give a cent, um, but we'll talk about it a little bit more later, it, like what proper payment it could be. Then you wanna uh, type in the number of respondents that you want. So for my gender, gender schema research that I was talking about, um, I got 300 responses. So I'll kind of show you that here in a second. Now you also control the amount of time that you allot to workers. Now, this is something um, that I kind of debate on how many, how much time I really want to give them. Because on the one hand, it's good to give them um, a lot of time, but then it, it also might not be great because if you're doing something that requires like them to have knowledge of something, they might look up some things online to get more knowledgeable about it, which could, you know, hurt the reliability of results. So that could be, you know, something individually for you all to kind of think about as you're creating these experiments in MTurk. Then you can also create, um, or how many days away you want your survey to expire in. So the default option here is seven days. Now, really this depends on honestly how much you're offering uh, for your surveys to be completed. So for my gender, gender schema research, I offered a dollar per response. Um, which is a little on the higher end, but it's not um, unreasonable by any means. And we got our 300 responses in a matter of hours. So we definitely didn't need our survey to expire in seven days. Um, but if you're offering, let's say, five cents to do like a 10 to do like a 10 minute survey, you're probably going to have a harder time, you know, getting a lot of fast responses to that. So really kind of what I'm getting at in in regards to the, the amount of time that your survey should expire in and the, ward, and the reward per response is to just really think about how fast you need these responses and also what do you think a fair price might be. And then lastly, we have this option for auto approve and pay workers in amount of time. So part of one thing that you're gonna do as a requester on MTurk, and I'll talk about this here in a second again, is that you need to decide whether or not you're going to accept someone's survey or reject it. Now, again, you probably go into a lot of these studies with um, the ideas in mind of what a disqualifiable survey would be, right? So for example, if they don't accept or if they um, don't answer your um, attention check questions correctly, then you're going to discard their survey, right? Now, the thing is, is that you have... Um, <clears throat> a specific amount of days that you can set for yourself for how long you'll give yourself to approve these workers. So, you know, if you only give yourself one day to do it and you have 300 responses to go through, 
one day might not be enough to actually go through and check to make sure that people did uh, the correct responses to all of them, right? So again, a lot of these things are things that you just might have to think about. There's no right or wrong answer to how long it should be until they get auto approved. But one thing is that if you, and this is something I ran into, if you don't approve your, um, your workers, um, they'll, they'll call them hits. Again, the, the task that they're completing, their, their human intelligence tasks are hits. So if they don't complete their, their hit, or if you don't accept their hit in like a certain amount of time, they'll probably send you emails being like, hey, when, when is my hit going to be accepted? So if you don't want to be bombarded with emails, it's generally a good idea to um, accept the hits as soon as you can. So that's another uh, thing to keep in mind when setting up your survey. Now, again, if you scroll even further down on uh, setting this up, you'll get to the worker requirements. Now, this is a really interesting section that you should probably pay attention to, is that the first option here is that you can require that your workers be masters to do your tasks. So now this is another thing that Amazon complete, keeps completely proprietary. Um, nobody really knows how Amazon selects their, um, their masters, but masters are basically just people who are better workers, if you will, their, um, their hits get accepted above 99%. That is the one thing that we do know about these Turkers is that they, um, the masters, they have to have a 99% uh, approval rate of their tasks. And then they also have to have completed a certain number of tasks. But other than that, these masters are, nobody necessarily knows how they're selected. But it costs a little bit more uh, if you want masters as your sample. So that's something to keep in mind. Again, there's, there's a lot of kind of personal preference here that you'll have to kind of keep in mind for your own individual research. Now, the second option is to specify any additional qualifications workers must meet uh, to work on your tasks. So there's different qualifications that you can select here and some of them cost money, some of them do not. So um, the only qualification that I had on my uh, gender schema research was that people be located in the United States which is extremely common. Uh, again, I just wanted to focus on, on US politics. It wasn't gonna be super relevant for people elsewhere in the world. So that's something that's, that's free that you can choose. So if you want only respondents from the United States, that's something that you can select. Um, there's other uh, qualifications that you can select that will cost money. Some of those being um, having like, uh, just as an example, like the amount that people work out in a week, uh, whether or not people diet, um, how much education they have. So these are all premium criteria or premium qualifications, as MTurk calls them, that you'll have to pay for. And again, all of these have kind of uh, different pricing details. So again, it's just something that you're gonna have to kind of keep in mind. If, if your experiment calls for something like that, then I suppose that's something that you'll have to do. But for my purposes, and I think for a lot of your purposes, you'll probably only need to use the included ones that are free. And then lastly, you just need to check it if your project contains adult content. Okay, so now uh, we get to the um, design layout portion here. So we see um, this is exactly what your workers will see or what the Turkers will see once you actually post your survey. So they'll have the survey link here. And then they also need to provide a survey code. So this is a really important thing to keep in mind is that at the end of your Qualtrics survey, you need it to um, produce some kind of unique identifier for the, um, for the Turkers to be able to post in, in here in MTurk so that you can um, associate their, their MTurk profile to their Qualtrics survey result. So that's gonna be really important. And then also if you don't include that, that code, um, they won't even really be able to submit their hit. So that's gonna be something really important to include that code. And then um, we can go to, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go back a second. Click through too many times. So then uh, we're just at our preview and finish and you can just select here to say, yes, I am actually done setting a survey and we're good to go. So once you get this set up and you have all of your uh, proper things figured out, you get to this screen where you see that you've created a new project. So as I've been kind of alluding to, we can see here my uh, gender schema um, project here, along with this, with this other one that I clicked through as I was creating uh, this, this PowerPoint here. So here we see that we can create a new batch with an existing project. 
So now that we just created this new project um, up here in the top left, that's where you would go if you wanted to create a new project. Uh, you can click on this new batch with an existing project to actually send out your survey to get results from people. So until you click this button, publish batch, you're not gonna start getting results uh, or people to sign up. So um, a batch is basically just them saying it's a, oh, what's a good way of putting it? A batch is basically just a, um, a collection of responses that you're gonna get. So you can send out multiple batches, right? So if you wanna do a pilot test, um, which, which me and my colleague did for our uh, gender schema study, you can send out just like, you know, 20 responses you want to get just for a pilot test to make sure that it's working the correct way that you want it to. And then you can send out an, an additional batch for like the 300 that you want for the actual experimental study. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Now, once you click publish batch, um, you'll just be able to, um, you know, start collecting responses. Then once you get your responses, um, you can go to the manage batches um, uh, kind of window up here. So you can click this, this manage uh, button right up at the top. So now we can look at our, at our uh, batches. Now here's just an example of one of what we would see once we've actually collected data. So I've already collected this data, obviously. I collected it over a year ago, so it's, it's a little to look at. But it tells you exactly when it was created how many assignments have been completed, and also the estimated completion time. So if it's still in progress, it will tell you how many people are still in progress, and then also how long on average is taken people to complete your survey from the very beginning of starting the hit to the very end of ending the hit. So this is kind of a, a useful screen here. And now if you actually click on the title here, Gender Schema and Politics, a Cognitive Study on Gender Issues in Politics 3, because it was the third batch we sent out, um, you can see, oh, let me advance the slide. Whoop. Okay, you'll get to this screen right here. So this will give you just some general information um, about your batch and basically how much you're being charged for it and things like that. So again, we see here average time per assignment, the average time that it took from the time that the person opened up the hit on MTurk to the point that they completed the hit on MTurk, it took them 39 minutes. So that isn't just them in Qualtrics doing the survey. That's also them, you know, dealing with the logistical issues of working with MTurk. And then we have, um, you can see the results here. So you can see the amount of assignments that are still pending your, your review. So the ones that you still need to accept or reject the assignments that you've actually approved. So you can see I approved 300 of them. And then the assignments that you rejected. So you can also see how many you rejected. So in this particular instance, I rejected 54. So we were left with our 300. Now, one thing I should mention is that for the 54 that you rejected, you're not paying um, those 54 people for it. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. And then we see the cost summary down here. So uh, the estimated total reward, again, a dollar per person. So it'd be $300 total. And then the estimated fees to Mechanical Turk. So this is one of the drawbacks uh, for MTurk is that they take a 20 cent cut um, of, of your uh, total price, right? So like for this instance, $300, um, they get 120, right? So they get 20% of 300. So you're paying that on top of it. So in total for this, we paid $420, as you can see. Now, another thing, um, to kind of think about here is that this is where you would go uh, to review your results. So this is where you would go to see how long people spent on your survey. You can also do that in Qualtrics, but again, you can see how long they spent in MTurk on here. Um, so this is where you would go to review the results. You could see how many times these people have taken your surveys before and things like that. Um, so again, I don't have any results that are currently active. So it's, it's kind of hard to visualize this, but this is where you would go to actually see how people have responded. And then lastly, this is the last thing I wanted to show you in MTurk is that this is kind of the manage uh, work um, option here. So you can see how many different, how many times people have taken um, your surveys before or done your tasks before. So you can see here like the lifetime approval rate for certain people um, or whether or not, um, how many times you've blocked them or if you've ever blocked them. So this is where you can manage your workers and you can basically say, I don't wanna get this worker in one, of my, um, in one of my studies again. And you can 
and you can just kind of manage your workers this way. So this is a, a nice thing to keep in mind. So with that in mind, now that I've kind of given you a little bit of a, of a walkthrough of how to actually set up uh, these, these studies in MTurk, I just wanna do a little bit of a discussion of what are the advantages of MTurk and then also what are some of the disadvantages or some of the limitations? So the first and foremost, it's very, very easy to use, right? So um, the user interface on their website is really easy to use as most Amazon things are. That's really nice. So even if you're not super into technology, you don't need to know how to use Python or R in order to you know, set up your study here. It's, it's pretty easy. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's more nationally representative than student pools. However, it is definitely not completely national represent or nationally representative. Um, but, you know, as, as far as social scientists are concerned, I would definitely say this is a better option than student pools. And I don't think that that's necessarily controversial to say that. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about the actual demographics of the workers here in a second. Another advantage of MTurk is that you can get really fast responses. So like I said, if you, um, if you price your um, survey at the correct price, you can get very, very fast responses. So like I said, for the gender schema research I did, we got our responses all in a few hours because you know we gave just a dollar was enough to entice people to do that. And then lastly, it's pretty expensive. Um, so when you're thinking about it, being able to get responses from a, a pool that's more nationally representative than student pools and how quickly you can get these responses, um, getting 300 responses for $420 in, the, in a matter of hours from a decent you know, population or sample, I would say is a win. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty good way for social scientists to be able to collect data in a pretty inexpensive way. Now, what are some of the disadvantages of MTurk? As I said, it's not nationally representative. Um, so again, I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide here, but that's just a, a limitation to kind of keep in mind. Secondly, workers may be too familiar with academic research. So a lot of workers do um, a lot of studies on MTurk. I'll kind of go into that here in a second as well. So they might be a little bit too familiar with, with academic research, right? So they know to look out for attention check questions. Um, they know kind of what you're looking for a lot of times. So that's actually a disadvantage over a student pool, I would say. You know, students haven't taken as many surveys as these people on MTurk have. So that's something to keep in mind. And then, like I said, there's issues with attention checks. Um, even if you include attention checks, the workers are looking for attention check questions um, and they can kind of sniff them out. So, you know, we got to really make sure that we're using attention check questions and, uh, and using them properly because a lot of these workers obviously, you know, want, and, and rightfully so, want to get through a lot of these tasks as fast as possible, right? Because they're not paid by the hour, they're paid by how many they actually do. So they're trying to get through them quickly, right? So there's also issues with attention checks there. So those are some of the disadvantages. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the um, disadvantages of MTurk here and talk a little bit more about who the workers of MTurk actually are because MTurk hasn't really come out and said, uh, you know, the demographics of who their uh, workers are. So Pew Research has done some pretty interesting uh, research to kind of look into this a little bit. So here is how Turkers in, the, in this Pew Research Center study compare with all working adults. So um, this was a sample of, I think, three or 4,000 MTurk workers. And you can see that you know, the, uh, the gender makeup of workers on Mechanical Turk versus all working adults is, is pretty similar, right? However, once you get to the other demographics, that's really once um, you know, the demographics become apparent. So household income, for example, Workers on MTurk really skew um, a little bit poorer than the general working adults. And that probably shouldn't come as a surprise uh, considering how much people are making working on MTurk. So that doesn't necessarily come as a surprise, um, but it definitely skews a little bit poorer than the, than, the, uh, than the normal working adult in the United States. And additionally, we can see that the age of um, the workers on MTurk are far younger than the um, normal working adult population of the US, right? So we can see that there's literally 90% of MTurk workers are under the age of 50, right? So people are familiar with the internet and things like that. Um, 
So again, you're just going to be kind of getting a younger sample than you would be if you're sampling actually the American public at large. Race and ethnicity, um, mTurk skews very white. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you're going to have a very limited, um, you know, diver diverse sample. You're just not going to have a very diverse sample when you use mTurk. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then, um, interestingly as well, is that mTurk workers are on average more educated than uh, the working adult population. So that's something to keep in mind as well, is that they might be more familiar with some of these uh, you know, concepts that you might be looking for. A lot of them have, um, you know, more than 50% of them have college degrees. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as well. So this is just an overview of some of the demographics of the workers. And, you know, there's a lot of debate going on in academia right now about whether or not this really affects that much about um, you know, the validity and the reliability of our results. Um, what I would say again, though, is that this is a far better sample than student pools, and student pools is generally a pretty accepted way to collect uh, data. So if you want to do something a little bit um, more nationally representative than student pools, I would say that this is a good way to do it. Now, <clears throat> this is a, a graph showing us the time per week that Turkers spend on the site. And it really varies greatly. So um, when I say that, you know, like um, a lot of these people have a lot of, um, sorry, a lot of experience with working with academic research, I'm, I'm really not saying that lightly because, you know, 18% um, of them, you know, work on MTurk from 21 to 40 hours a week. And then some people, like 5% of the people work on MTurk 40, 41 hours or more a week. And then, so it really varies greatly how much people work on MTurk, right? So some people treat it like a part-time job. Some people just kind of like do it for fun at night. I mean, I even have, um, I, I know a couple of people who um, who are Turkers and, and they just kind of do it for fun at night sometimes, stuff like that. So it really varies, right? The goals that people, that these workers have on MTurk. So this is something to kind of keep in mind. Now, um, price-wise, most mechanical Turk tasks uh, paid 10 cents or less. So I would say though, for surveys, particularly like experimental surveys that might, you know, make people watch videos or read something, I would have a really hard time with uh, giving them like 10 cents to do that task. So I would highly recommend to move it up into the, you know, like dollar range probably. And only 11% of tasks uh, pay a dollar or more, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind is the actual price that they're paid. Now, again, there's no right or wrong answer for what to pay them, um, but it's just something to keep in mind. And then um, how much do workers get paid per hour? So again, this really depends on how fast they're actually completing surveys and how fast they're completing these hits. But the majority, 52%, make less than $5 per hour. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. And then 39% make between $5 and $8 an hour. And then only about 8% make $8 or more on MTurk. And I would venture to guess that they're probably not paying too much attention uh, to the surveys either. So this is something I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about on the next slide, but um, you know, it's just like kind of ethically uh, speaking, you know, can we like, how should we use MTurk? You know, like how much should we be paying ethically? You know, so that's something I think we should consider. So with that in mind, like what are the ethical ramifications of using MTurk? And I'm, I'm starting to, uh, to wrap up here in a second, by the way. Um, so most workers make less than $5 per hour, as we already said. And, you know, there's no benefits to workers. These people aren't having a, a healthcare plan or, or dental insurance or anything like that. So that's something that we should kind of keep in mind as we're using MTurk. And then this is um, also kind of a, a crazy fact, is that workers located out, outside the United States and India are paid in Amazon gift certificates. They're not paid in like actual currency. They're paid in Amazon gift certificates. So it's like not even real money, really. And then lastly, you know, this really coming all together, it's contributing to the gig economy, right? So um, this has been kind of a big issue with the, um, you know, with research in the past like decade or so is, is the gig economy and, and how researchers might be contributing to it via things like MTurk. Um, so 
for those of us who are social science scientists and um, you know aware of like the human condition, I just think it's something that we should be kind of aware of as we're creating our surveys, right? So I think we should be really kind of intentionally thinking about how much we're paying these people um, to complete our surveys, right? Because like, is it super right to give someone a 30 minute survey and pay them a dollar? Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily sure if that's right. Um, so that's something that we should be thinking about as we're creating our surveys in MTurk. Okay, um, so just kind of to wrap up here before we do our second Q&A session, just a summary is that the C-SPAN video library should be used more for experimental research, right? There's over 270,000 270, hours of content available on the C-SPAN website, and that goes across many different disciplines. So people from all across the social sciences and even the hard sciences or natural sciences can, can use the C-SPAN video library um, for experimental research, right? So that's something that I think more people should use, and, and hopefully you all can kind of think about this and, and hopefully use this in, in, in your own experimental research. And then MTurk provides a really easy way to collect survey data, right? It's, it's pretty approachable, uh, even if you don't really know that much about technology, it's, it's something that you can kind of get into and you can understand. And then while not nationally representative, it is definitely better than student samples, right? So, uh, you know, student samples generally average about 20 years old. And I believe my average that I had for my schema uh, research was in the high 20s was, was my um, average sample, which is good, right? Because if you're trying to make claims of generalizability, which generally people doing experimental research are, you know, it's good to have an older sample than a younger sample like that, right? So these are all things to keep in mind um, as we do experimental research using MTurk. So with that in mind, uh, thank you. I appreciated the uh, opportunity to do this and I would love to answer any of your questions as they came up. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, I'll, I'll start you off. I guess I was surprised at that first screen where you give the price that you're willing mm -hmm. to pay, but you don't, you don't have any idea, the Turk doesn't have any idea what they're required to do. Like it's $1 per the task and the task is a survey. Yep. So they don't know if there's 10 questions, whether they haven't watched video, you know, I, that, I guess I was surprised that there wasn't more detail there. Yeah, it's, I think that that's a really good point and something that Amazon could probably do better. Truly, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, workers really don't have much of an idea of, of how long it's going to take. Um, mm -hmm. you, you actually do kind of, um, you know, give workers a little bit of an idea, like in your like consent form and stuff like that, how long it'll take. But yeah, you're, you're right. In MTurk, they don't necessarily know how long it'll take. They don't even know like what the survey is going to be about necessarily other than just reading your own description. So yeah, I mean, a lot of times they are just kind of going into these blind. So it's, it's, it's a pretty weird uh, system. So you're definitely right about that. What do you mean? What did you mean when you said reading your description? Where do, would they see that? Yeah. So uh, let me go back to it. So, so right here, you can give a description, just like a few sentences, basically, um, about your, uh, your research and, and kind of what you're doing. So you can give a description there. And then um, this is where it would pop up right here um, underneath survey link instructions. It would pop up, it would say, we're conducting an academic survey about whatever. So that's kind of where these, um, these workers would get a little bit of information about what the survey would be about. But again, it's not gonna be very specific and they're probably not gonna have a really good idea of how long it'll take either. So you're right, it's, you know, they're kind of going into a blind. Other questions? So Zach, quick question. If you have, um, let's say you do uh, your MTurk online, but you want to get a more expansive pool uh, audience, mm -hmm. uh, would you be able to, or do you think it'd be theoretically feasible to combine like, let's say your student pool data with the information from the um, MTurk? I think that that could actually be, um, that could be a reasonable approach. Um, it could definitely be a reasonable approach, yeah. I, I don't necessarily, 
Like if I'm gonna use mTurk, I'm probably only going to want to use the results I get from mTurk because again, it, they'll probably be a little bit more reliable than the student pool. Um, so like you definitely could, and theoretically, like that would definitely make sense and it would be a valid thing to do. I just don't necessarily see the need uh, to combine the use of a student pool and the mTurk pool. I suppose if you have a very limited budget and you're like, I can only afford to do this many surveys in mTurk, I suppose then you could combine them, but that's kind of the only um, the only reason I would ever do that. Okay. Yeah, Robert. Okay, this is, you may not know the answer to this, but some people on the call might want to know the answer, and that is, can you use university funds to pay for MTurk? Yes, you definitely can. Um, and I have done that. So um, yes, you definitely can use uh, university funds. So uh, for those of us in the communication department, you can use your, your own communication funds uh, that, that we're given for research. You can use your own funds for that. And I think that that's a, a very good usage of it uh, because uh, just speaking from my own experience with our own student pool, it can take you know, weeks or months even to collect enough responses from our student pool, depending on the time of year, it can take a long time. But again, if you're willing to pay a little bit of money on MTurk to get those responses, you know, it, it becomes a lot faster to get your, to get your research mm -hmm. done. Other Anybody questions? else have, have any questions? An I, could, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have explained it that well. Come on. <laughs> I, ha I have one quick question. So um, I, I don't know whether you've uh, used Prolific before, because uh, that's what I'm, I'll be using, right? And um, I, if you're not aware of prol Prolific, that's totally fine. But if you are- Yeah, I don't, I don't have experience with it, but- uh, Okay, okay. Because yeah, <laughs> I mean, like they pay better to their uh, workers, mm -hmm. right? They have like a minimum pay and like, they have a sliding scale, which makes you feel really bad if you pay them less, right? <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> They really tap that. Uh, but yeah, no, so I, then it's fine because I was going to ask you if, if why you think MDurk might be better than Prolific, but if you don't, then it's totally fine. Yeah, um, yeah. Since, since I don't really know anything about Prolific, I can't really speak to that. Any other questions? <laughs> Yeah, I'd be interested to see if anybody has any projects that they're working on that mm -hmm. that would fit in with this. So, uh, Zach, how did you know anything about your demographics? Um, I so I I had them answer demographic questions in my survey. Um, yeah, because that's the much only way to get you know demographic mm -hmm. information about the workers is to simply ask them in your survey. Um, so yeah, I would actually, in general with student pools, I don't give um, as many demographic questions as I do for like my MTurk uh, pools. Because again, mm -hmm. I wanna get a little bit more demographic information about these workers. Um, so honestly, when, when I'm thinking about doing my surveys in MTurk, I'm thinking the, the more demographic information, the better, right? Because that way I can just get a little bit more information about uh, who these people are. So it, again, it just makes it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And one yep. thing you didn't explain was an attention hit uh, or whatever it was called. Yeah, an attention check. Check. Yeah. So um, doing any kind of online survey research, um, you need to always do, or just survey research in general, you need to use attention check questions. So this would basically be um, you now randomly, basically, in the middle of your survey, so in between other like normal questions, you'd have an attention check question where you're basically saying, this question is not a real question. It is an attention check. Uh, please check yes to this question. Or it would say like select answer four for this question, whatever, right? And if someone answers that incorrectly, then you immediately know that they weren't paying attention and you can discard their survey. So I believe that these are especially important to use in MTurk because like I said, these workers are trying to get through these as quickly as possible. So it's really important that you utilize attention check questions and many of them, like more than you would use with a student pool, I would say as well. Um, you should definitely use multiple attention check questions. And then, you know, given how long your survey is, I would say one attention check question for every like 10 or 15 questions you have, probably something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, yep, that's how you should utilize attention checks. 
And you used the first batch as sort of a testing. Is that what you did with the 20 questions? Yeah, 20 basically. Respondents? Yep. Yeah, we used um, the first batch basically is just a pilot study. So we just wanted to make sure that our, our mm -hmm. Qualtrics survey was actually working correctly, number one. And then um, number two, you know, we wanted to check and make sure if, if there were any problems with it. So we just wanted to go through and make sure that our uh, questions were loading correctly. Um, so we did like a couple of uh, factor analyses to make sure that our, um, that our questions were actually working the way that we intended for them to work. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a, a whole other thing that, that's a positive about MTurk is that you can do just pilot studies on MTurk actually. So like you could do, you know, a 10 or 20 person um, pilot study on MTurk and then you could do the rest of your study using student pool. But if you're like under a really strict deadline or like really want to get something live quickly and, uh, and you don't have a lot of time to do a pilot study, you know, you could, it would be pretty cheap to do a pilot study on MTurk and, you know, just get it done really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's an advantage there too, of doing pilot studies on MTurk. All right. If there's no final questions, I think we'll wrap up. Um, this is our last, uh, workshop of the semester. Um, we're uh, really thankful, uh, Zach, for introducing us to a new topic that uh, not been, I mean, people have heard about, but you really took us inside both to the research, to the video library, and to the MTurk interface to get us, you know, thinking of what, you know, you gave us a shortcut because you thought through all these issues, stumbling through in a way the first time, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> and so now we've got some pointers and whatever. And so I'm hoping that that rings true to people that they have an idea of what they might do with the video library. So thank you so much. And thank Andrea for putting this together. And we'll look forward to hearing from you all if you have any ideas and looking forward to seeing you next semester. Thanks again, Zach. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a, it was a mm -hmm. fun time. All right. There's some contact information, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from anyone. Thanks so much.